The nation will fall silent today at 11am to remember all of those who've given their lives for this country in conflict since the First World War. The service at the Cenotaph in London will be particularly poignant because it is going to be the first led by the King since the passing of His Late Majesty uh, the Queen. Now, our security and defence editor, Deborah Haynes, spoke to the Chief of the Defence Staff, Admiral Sir Tony Radkin, for this programme. They discussed the war in Ukraine and also pressures on defence spending, but she began by asking about remembrance. I think Remembrance Sunday is always poignant. I think it's poignant for the whole nation, this special moment when we pause to reflect on the sacrifice and commitment of others to provide our freedom today. I think there's a special poignancy this year with both the loss of Her Majesty, uh, another loss of a Second World War veteran. And I also think it's poignant when we have once again the spectre of war in Europe and all that that entails, and a country that's been invaded and is fighting for its freedom. We're remembering the, um, those who gave their lives in the First and the Second World Wars, and like you said, right now, Europe has war once again on its soil. How likely is it that this could actually escalate into a, the Third World War? I think what you've seen, we're approaching now nearly nine months, is that the war is relatively contained in terms of geography. The impact of the war is enormous, that's global. The impact on food prices, the impact on millions of people and whether or not they were going to get the grain that Ukraine provides. The impact on all of us, whether it's inflation or the energy crisis. And I think those are all a reminder that even though the war itself might be relatively physically contained, what it means is millions of people that have been displaced from their country millions of people that are being attacked and they're losing their energy or their water doesn't work anymore. Millions of people fighting for their freedom. That's what you're seeing. And tens of thousands of people that are dying or are injured. And, and it's that reminder that these precious values of, of, of freedom, of democracy, of that your territory is your own, and that when that's attacked, then the right people defend those and they fight to get them back. Now, we're talking um, just after Russia has given this order to withdraw its troops from Kherson city in the south of Ukraine. How significant is that? I think it's significant in the sense that, once again, you're seeing Russia fail. Russia's failed on all of its strategic objectives. It wanted to subjugate Ukraine. The opposite is hap has happened. Ukraine is fighting for its freedom. It wanted to take control of the cities. You saw that fail. It wanted to, to weaken NATO. NATO is stronger. And now you're seeing a war that inevitably, at the tactical level, has twists and turns. But you're seeing a Russia under pressure, taking desperate measures. That's why it's had to mobilise additional people. But it's, it's got to try and overcome a nation that's fighting for its freedom, a nation that we're supporting alongside lots of other international countries, whether that's cash, whether that's armament, whether that's ammunition. So your US counterpart, um, General Mark Milley, has said that the uh, withdrawal um, in Kherson could um, provide a window of opportunity for negotiations between the two sides. What do you think? I think that those windows will be determined by President Zelensky and President Putin. And, and undoubtedly, the tactical events might open those windows a little bit more, but we've got to respect that Ukraine is fighting for its territory, its future, its survival. Um, and this is a success for Ukraine, but at the same time, Ukraine continues to be attacked. Ukraine has lost ground that it needs to win back. Ukraine has got millions of people that are not living in their homes. They're either living elsewhere in Ukraine or in the rest of Europe. They've got millions of people that are suffering from the impacts of the electrical infrastructure having been attacked or the water infrastructure being attacked. It is a war crime to, to, a, to, to deliberately attack civilians and, and that's what's still going on. And is there any change in your assessment on the likelihood of Russia backed into a corner resorting to a nuclear strike in Ukraine? 
I think we've got to be really careful of, of, of reckless rhetoric where, where, where the, the, these noises are made about, about nuclear, whether it's a dirty bomb or it's a tactical nuclear weapon. We should be really careful about that language. That would be another total horrific step and we don't see that, that we're on a pathway to, 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 that, to that particular spectre. Uh, and we've also got to be really clear that if we started to go down that path, that it would lead to incredibly serious consequences, but where none of us are on that path. And Russia, I think, has tried to, to reassure in that sense, and I think we've been really clear as to how dangerous that that particular route would be. Um, Sky News reported this week about um, claims that Russia has transported captured British NLAW anti-tank missiles, US anti-tank javelins and US Stinger anti-aircraft missiles to Iran along with loads of cash, £122 million worth in cash, um, in exchange for dozens of drones, these deadly um, Shahed drones that, they've been used, that Russia's been using in Ukraine. Were you aware of this? So I won't, I won't go into the detail of intelligence reports, but we've always been aware that when we provide some of our weaponry and it's going into a war zone, there's a risk that that weaponry might be captured. And, and so what I can offer you is that the, the technology that we're talking about is technology of 20, 30 years ago, and then that technology is used in the manufacturing process to provide the weapons of today. And, and so I, we, we're conscious that when we provide armament and support to a Ukraine that's in, in a war, then there might be some of those weapons that end up being captured, and that's taken into account when, when, when we go through our assessment as to what's going to be provided. So are you going to do anything about it if Iran is trying to develop end laws? So, uh, we're in a constant competition with certain nations. It's very much the case with Iran. But it's, 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 a, it's a fact that when you provide your weapons to, to country X in the middle of a war, they may not necessarily stay in country X. The Chancellor is going to be giving his autumn statement on Thursday. How confident are you that defence will be protected from the impact of inflation and foreign exchange? I can't go into the detail of, of, of a, a financial state, statement that's, that's, that's going to be announced later this week. But what I can offer you is the seriousness with which the situation is being discussed. We have a Prime Minister, he's, he's been Prime Minister for just over two weeks. He's had numerous conversations with the Defence Secretary, with me, about the security situation in Europe but also the globe. But we specifically had an hour with the Prime Minister and the Chancellor, and I accompanied the Defence Secretary to talk about what would be the impact of a financial settlement and, and to the, the richness and the seriousness of that conversation, recognising that this war in Europe is part of the reason why we have the level of inflation that we have and why we have the economic pressure. And therefore, in trying to deal with the economic pressure, we need to acknowledge that at its core is this security pressure in Europe. And, and the government is, is, is having the right level of conversation to try and manage that, but also manage the security situation into the future. So that's why you're seeing a conversation about coming back to the integrated review of last year and, and, and taking time to, to assess that again, what, 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 what is working, where, what do we want to affirm, and what might we want to adjust and, and, and recognise because of the increased aggression of Russia, we, we, we need to adjust some of the risks that we were taking, and that might mean in the longer term more investment. But let's have that, com that, that longer term conversation as well. The government keeps saying there needs to be economic stability in order to have things like defence spending. Do you think they're now realising that the, there cannot be economic stability without security? <clears throat> and in terms of having security, you need, therefore, to invest fully in defence? 
Absolutely, and I think you saw that with last year's integrated review, an integrated review that tried to take into an integrated, account... An integrated review that's not going to be funded unless this government gives you eight billion pounds, according to the Defence Secretary himself, over the next two years. Are you going to get this eight billion pounds? So I can't, I can't, I can't go into the specifics, but, but I what can... happens if you don't get it? So again, I, I, I think it would be wrong to, to start talking about if we don't get it, then it means this, this and this. Those conversations are being had with the Prime Minister and the Chancellor. They're private conversations. I can assure you that those conversations are being had. They're the right conversations. And they're being blended with what was said in last year's integrated review, what needs to be shaped for the longer term future, but also to recognise the, the immediate economic pressure the country is under, but also recognise there's a war in Europe. And that, that, that the, the seriousness of those conversations are being had, and that's the assurance I can give you. Well, I'm sure they're serious, but if they don't end up with, with £8 billion for defence over the next two years, then they're meaningless. It means defence has to shrink. Would you resign if that happens? So, so we've got to wait and see what the autumn statement says. I think we've got to be really cautious of... Of, of, of the risk of being a bit too shrill and saying, right, if, if, if this happens, then I'm going to, yeah, 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 this person's going to resign. And that's, I, I'm much more in the space of the right conversations are being had. Let's wait and see what the autumn statement says. Let's take stock then. Let's recognise there's a blend going on of economic pressures that have to be serviced and security pressures that have to be serviced and the right conversations are being had to allow, to allow those solutions to emerge.